Hi. I know everyone's talking about COVID-19 and staying home, but if you've been here long enough, you know, I don't talk much about current events. And I'm not going to this week either. This video is for libertarians, conservatives, classical liberals, constitutionalists, objectivists, and whoever else believes in small or limited government. Many of these people are very clear and outspoken about the fact that they want small government, but they're much less vocal about what that would actually mean or how, realistically, that wish could be realized. The word for the philosophy of small or minimal government is minarchism. There are a lot of minarchists out there nowadays. Some of them call themselves libertarians, classical liberals, conservatives. There are also libertarian socialists who believe in a limited state, and some of these arguments apply to them too. They think, or, or they say they think, to maximize freedom, you should minimize the size of government. But government still needs to be in charge of some essentials. This video is about why small government is a myth. And if you really believe in freedom, you'd be better off trying to eliminate the state altogether. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Like most people, minarchists don't really get how the state works. I've made a whole video on it you can watch, but in the meantime, Forget everything you learned in civics class. The state is an involuntary institution that establishes a social hierarchy and works for the people on top of that hierarchy. Its purpose is, and has always been, to empower a small minority of the population to live off the labor of everybody else. I don't care how democratic you think it is, or how much you've been told to love your rulers and their parties. States do not, and by their nature, cannot work for all the people. It's just rhetoric. All states work for their owners, the power elite, whoever that is. If its purpose was to work for the people, it would be voluntary and non-hierarchical, like a community or a co-op. We'd be able to control it, rather than the other way around. And before we go on, if you think big government is synonymous with socialism, please watch my last video. Because it isn't. If you want to know where the line between big gov and small gov is, so do I. It's actually arbitrary. And you know it's arbitrary because self-styled minarchists will pull their big gov sucks hashtag out for anything they disapprove of. Some philosophers have tried to draw the line, but they get stuck on the details. They seem to think government is generally bad and capitalism good, so they're trying to get the right mix. But they can't. Realistically, they will never get the right mix to design a state, because they don't recognize that government and capitalism have a symbiotic relationship. One grows as the other grows. They're two forces that both exist for the purpose of concentrating wealth and power and protecting the small proportion of the population who has power from everybody else. Big government, the, the term big government, is associated with being bureaucratic, intrusive, controlling, and inefficient. I don't think there could be a government that isn't all those things. Certainly not nowadays, as the modern state has grown out of all proportion to assume all kinds of powers, policing every aspect of life. If we really want freedom for everybody, it shouldn't have any of those powers. It shouldn't have the power to stop us from engaging in victimless activities, for instance, right? 
except because for most people there's no clear line between big and small government, they only want to shrink the government in ways that don't inconvenience them. Small gov? So the government will let women decide whether or not they want an abortion from now on? No? No, when it comes to letting women do what they want with their own bodies, a lot of minarchists suddenly believe in big government. And what's their policy on legalizing drugs? If you're really against the war on drugs and you think all drugs should be legalized, okay, great, you're on the side of freedom. But a lot of people who claim government should stop intervening in our lives make an exception for putting things in our bodies that don't actually hurt others. But isn't that hypocrisy? And it would save lives. Same with legalizing prostitution. That would save lives, too. Same with police patrols in black and indigenous neighborhoods. Or surveillance of anyone who's brown just because white people are afraid of terrorism. Sure, small gov, except when they call the police for everything instead of resolving things peacefully with the people around them. Small gov, except for a trillion dollar military budget. Small gov, but the president just used the term national security. So everyone needs to fall in line or else you hate America. Small gov, but of course we need a militarized border to stop most of the people who want to come in. Some people actually make the argument that immigrants tend to vote Democrat, and that's why you shouldn't let them in. In other words, take away their freedom to move to a new place. In fact, erect a huge bureaucracy and police force because they don't believe in freedom. If you never actually apply your philosophy, if everything is an exception, you might not actually believe in it. When I see Tea Partiers advocating eliminating all policies that destroy others' freedom, I'll stand next to them. Until then, for every law or program you advocate, assume your worst enemy is going to be the one implementing it. Because at some point, they will be. The term small government seems to be used more to get you to vote for people who use it than anything else. That guy said small gov while running for office, so we should vote for him. Republican politicians love to throw the terms big and small government out there, but it's just rhetoric. When have they ever shrunk anything? They just wanted your vote. Some minarchists will point to people like Reagan and Thatcher as heroes of small government. Really, they're heroes of neoliberalism which on paper is supposed to be about shrinking government, but in practice leaves them with all the same powers they had before. Reagan and Thatcher didn't really do anything to shrink the size of government in, like, money terms, or how many laws they pass, or how many people they employ. And why would they? They would have lost some of their power if they'd shrunk the state. And the wealthy people they worked for would have lost some of their power. It's just, it would have just been irrational. Let's look at Reagan, a guy who once said, government is not a solution to our problem, government is the problem. Did he really believe that? Or maybe more to the point, did he really act on that belief? Well, let's take a look here. If we look at this link that this person has very kindly provided, you can see some charts of how things uh, have grown over time. And the links are all in the description, so you can look this up for yourself if you're skeptical, and you should be. But, um, you know, this, this particular thing uh, shows how many people the federal government employs, and you can see from all these charts that during uh, the period of, of Reagan's time in office, from 1980 to 1988, or you could say 81 to 89, depending how you look at it, um, he did nothing to shrink the... In fact, it's quite stagnant. 
total U.S. population. That's just the percentage of the population employed by the federal government. But obviously, it didn't change at all during his time. And that's just the bottom. Um, we could go back up. You can see uh, judicial and legislative branch employees. The number has grown, or it grew, I should say, over the 80s. Um, same uh, military personnel didn't really change much. It, it kind of went up a little bit during that time. <laughs> and uh, people, uh, civilian employees employed by the executive branch, same thing. It went up. <laughs> Did he do anything to reduce taxes? I don't think so. Again, you can take a look. You can start over here from 1980, go down eight years later. Is there much difference? Is there any difference? No. In fact, he raised taxes a bunch of times. That may or may not have changed uh, the amount of revenue very much, but he did raise taxes. Did he shrink the budget, shrink spending at all? Well, again, 1980. See any difference between 1980 and 1988? Not really. Not really. What it means is these supposed small gov types, they don't really do anything to shrink the government. In fact, Reagan and Thatcher both added to the deficit. Americans today are still paying for what Reagan did. In what way was he small government? What you need to understand is no president is going to reduce the deficit significantly, or taxes or anything like that, without, without screwing over the poorest and most vulnerable people anyway. No president will ever reduce taxes and reduce spending and shrink the size of the state, whether or not you know, in any way that you want them to. It just doesn't work that way. It doesn't matter what ideology they hold. It doesn't matter if they call themselves small government conservatives. What matters is the state is and always will be owned by the richest and best connected people. You will never persuade those people to shrink the state in a way that would benefit you. If the way the state is now benefits those rich and influential people, it's not going to change. Another thing you should understand is the people in power, they know all this. And they use the slogans and the ideology of small government to make you think it's possible to keep you voting for war hawks like Reagan who promise to shrink the size of the state and then just blame the Democratic Party when they don't. I was going to eliminate half the laws and taxes and bureaucracy for the sake of freedom, but those damn Democrats stopped me. Oh well, guess I'll have to invade Nicaragua. Once the so-called representative in office is is actually in office, you really have no way of holding them accountable. They'll do all the big government projects they like, and there's very little you can do about it without mounting a whole big campaign. Why do you continue to let these people work against your interests, with the only hope being that you'll, you'll vote them out to look forward to? That's all you have is that maybe you'll vote them out. So you can see how small gov is more just a slogan than anything. See, the people in power know that most of us can be influenced and tricked just by using words and symbols that appeal to us. They say small gov, and that's supposed to create all kinds of positive connotations. Freedom, peace, prosperity, efficient and representative government, and so on. But until we actually have those things, they're all in our heads. All the things minarchists want the freedom to do are hampered by the existence of the state. You want to move to a new place and build a house? But you'd better get permission. 
because states are a monopoly on land. What if the friend of a state official wants to build on the land you had your eye on? You're screwed. Do you want to be self-sufficient in growing your own food, hunting, fishing, gathering? What if any one of those things is restricted by law? Well, all of them are, really. Government is a monopoly on making and implementing laws. You want to pay less taxes, right? Well, as a citizen, that's not your decision to make. The state decides how much tax you pay and where the money goes. What are you going to do about it? Vote hopefully so nothing will change but you can pretend you're doing your part. Revolt and then put a new government in and go through the same thing again next year. Or maybe we could implement some direct democracy so that the voters would have a direct say in specific policies. But that would take all the power away from the people who own the state. So that'll never happen. See, once you have a state, the genie is out of the bottle. The choice is no longer yours. You'll do what the people who rule you tell you to do, or you'll get your ass kicked. If they choose to expand the state beyond the limits you think you've set, they're going to. How would you stop them? A constitution? Constitutions don't stop states because no one forces them to adhere to one. If your answer is voting, well, voting does not solve specific problems. In a modern so-called democracy, you don't vote for reforms or changes. You vote for people who don't have to do what you want them to do. If your answer is to pick up guns and force them to do what they want, uh, to do what you want, of course, uh, the obvious question arises, why let them have that power in the first place? Because there's some law of the universe that says a few people have to have power over everyone else? Another question minarchists need to consider is why you would want to leave the nation-state system in place. One reason states can grow so big is they control huge amounts of territory and tax the entire population of that territory and turn them into workers. They always try to expand their power, and that includes expanding how much territory they rule. They call it a nation nowadays, but it's really just a bunch of different people pushed together and held there by force. They use propaganda to foster nationalism and justify imperialism. And if those sentiments are strong enough, or if the people are just apathetic, the state will keep expanding. Some minarchists hold up the, the U.S. at Confederation as their example. But in only a couple of hundred years, the U.S. has gone from renegade republic to one of the biggest, most oppressive empires the world has ever seen. Or why would you want to keep the rule of law in place? Why should the most powerful people have a monopoly on creating and enforcing laws? The rule of law is a big part of the problem. It's portrayed as this objective force for justice, but laws are made for by powerful people for their own benefit. We've been told the Constitution exists to limit government, and that was a lie. It exists to create government. No piece of paper can limit government. We need to think really critically about the purpose of institutions like the rule of law and democracy because their purpose is never what we've been told all our lives. That's why this channel exists, to help us question things. And I have videos on all these subjects, so please go check them out. On the same note, most minarchists believe in an idealized form of capitalism. Depending who you talk to, they'll tell you uh, the state's role is to level the playing field, to free the market and protect everyone's property. But a state necessarily means the market is not free. 
it would have to work against the people with the biggest stakes and the biggest corporations to level the playing field and free the market. Those are the people who use the market to plunder the rest of us, while telling us the neoliberal state makes us all free and equal in opportunity. These are the people who benefit from our beliefs about what government is. They spend huge amounts, well, huge to you and me anyway, funding think tanks to create crowds of people who think that if you eliminate environmental regulations and the minimum wage, they might receive a larger share of the fruits of production. But that wouldn't happen. The rich would still take it. But to be aware of the propaganda is to know which of our beliefs benefit our rulers. The small gov ideal is a great tool to make conservatives support any policy that claims to devolve power from the state to the boss. Small gov isn't the most important idea they spread. Belief in capitalism keeps people showing up to work, while nationalism and racism are, are better at motivating them to action. But it's all part of the, the so-called conservative ideal. The rich garner support for their reforms from organizations like Turning Point USA, who go around making up nonsense about capitalism and socialism, like the incredible magic of capitalism where anyone can get rich, except most people, and the horrors of a socialism like the USSR and China that were never even socialist to begin with. So we associate ideas we've been told to embrace, like capitalism, with America. And evil ideas like socialism with evil foreign countries like Russia and China. That's how they get you. Our country and everything associated with it, good. Those foreign places and everything they believe, bad. I made this video because I'm convinced your brain is capable of seeing through that kind of bullshit. So what's the alternative? End the state. Eliminate it. Make it impossible for people to rule us. Ending the state is a pretty shocking thought to most people, and it tends to elicit questions about specifics before they've taken the time to think about it. You need to understand the reasons for a proposal first. If you said, without government, who would take care of the poor and homeless? You'd be ignoring the fact that the economic system the state imposes on us necessarily creates poverty and homelessness. Without government, how would we build schools? Schools are part of the problem, too. Once we realize whom the state works for, and that it can't by its nature work for all the people, we have different questions. The big government, small government dichotomy is a false one. There's either government that does whatever it wants and grows however it wants, or no government, where the people do whatever they want. The details, the specifics of self-governance and how to reduce any possible violence or make it impossible to exploit people. You know, it's the subject of a million books and articles and videos, and we don't have time for it here. But please, you know, go to other places in YouTube or, or check out uh, the Anarchist Library. All kinds of great resources there. Suffice it to say, the things you care about freedom, justice, peace, prosperity, these things are attainable, but not when there's a state wielding power over you. And I know it sucks to realize it, but the capitalist system is why the state exists and why it's so powerful. Sorry, big. There's no stateless capitalism. There's no capitalism without force. These things are fantasies supplied by the propaganda to get us to support the system as a whole and believe it's reformable. That's ultimately where the small gov mindset comes from. The belief, the hope, the state can represent the people and thus can be reformed to reflect what the people want. Sorry. 
but it's only ever reformed according to what the ruling class wants. And the ruling class is rich people, the bosses of your bosses of your bosses, the people who train you to follow the rules and then do whatever they want. Your lives are controlled, regulated, and taxed according to their interests. And you'll never persuade them to stop paying taxes or stop lobbying or whatever you want them to do against their own interests. So let's change this situation and end our oppression and work for the freedom of all people. Thank you.